All right, good morning. We're in Revelation chapter 22, and we're going to begin reading in verse 4, which is as far as we reached last time, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. So uh, Revelation 22, verse 4, and we're going to be thinking particularly uh, this morning on the simple theme, Behold, I come. Behold, I come. So beginning in verse 4, it says, And they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. And he saith unto me, Seal seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride said, come, and let him that heareth say, come, and let him that is athirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And again, God will bless, as ever, the public reading of the word of God. And uh, now as we consider, we want to just kind of finish off the section we were looking at, which was a description of the conditions in the holy city, the new Jerusalem. And that's just verses four and five. And then we'll we'll go from there to the epilogue of the book, which is from verse six to down to verse 21. So beginning in verse four, it says, there shall be no night there uh, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun for the Lord God giveth them light. They shall reign forever and ever. And so, <clears throat> of course, I, I jumped ahead and didn't read verse four, they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. And so again, they shall see his face. The very thing that Moses longed to see, if we look back at the book of Exodus, and it was not permitted. And again, partly because Moses was not in a glorified state, so was not in a fit condition uh, to be able to uh, see uh, God and his face. But in Exodus 33, verse 18, it, <clears throat> we we read these uh, words. Uh, 
And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And, and he said, I'll make all my goodness pass before thee, and I'll proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious, will show mercy on whom I'll show mercy. And he said, thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand in the rock, and it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. And so it wasn't possible for him to look on the face of God. Again, he's not in a glorified condition. Uh, it would perhaps have consumed him to see the glory of God uh, at that moment. But here we read in Revelation, in our new situation in the holy city, and there's a lovely promise, they shall see his face. That's beautiful. And not just that, but think of this. The Lord had promised in his teaching in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, verse 8, he said this, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And here we are in that heavenly city, and we will at that stage have a completely pure heart, right? Because uh, all of our sin will have been completely done away with, we'll be in an absolutely pure condition, and we'll be in a condition where we'll be able to see God and they shall see his face. His name shall be on their foreheads. Now, again, this was promised back in Revelation 3 and verse 12 to the overcomers. Remember, we said those are those that believe uh, that uh, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the true believers, those that are born again, the overcomers. Verse 12, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, I write upon him my new name. So his name shall be in their foreheads in direct fulfillment to the promise to the overcomers. And of course, we read that there's, we've already kind of talked about this, no need for the sun, no need for any artificial light. The glory of God and the glory of the Lamb is sufficient to light up the city with absolute perfect radiance there in verse 5. And then it says, they shall reign forever and ever. And that is this, this condition that we'll enter into in this heavenly city will go on forever and ever, unto the ages of the ages. Uh, that's the idea. Uh, the the, the thousand-year kingdom goes into the eternal kingdom, and that will continue without interruption throughout all eternity. And again, it's hard for our puny minds who are so time-focused to even grasp the, the idea of for all the ages of the ages will be in this blissful condition. Uh, in the presence of God, enjoying the glory of the Lord and of the glory of the Lamb, and just in this, this marvelous place where there's no sin, no sorrow, no tears. That's our eternal destiny. Surely that is something to which we can look forward to very much. And then I just want to read a kind of a summary of the conditions. This is by A.T. Pearson. Some of you may know that name. He wrote perhaps the finest biography on George Mueller, A.T. Pearson, and actually was close friends with Mueller and uh, was uh, lined up actually to kind of replace him at the orphanage, but the Lord had other plans. But really quite a man. A.T. Pearson says this, there shall be no more curse, perfect sinlessness. It, he says, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. Perfect government. The throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. Perfect government. And his servant shall serve him. There'll be perfect service, not spoiled by uh, fatigue or sin or anything else like that. They shall see his face. Perfect communion. Uninterrupted face-to-face -face fellowship with him. And his name shall be on their foreheads, because the name always implies character. And again, we're going to bear his character, so there'll be perfect resemblance of him throughout all eternity. There shall be no night there, perfect blessedness, no darkness at all. They shall reign forever and ever, perfect glory. <laughs> this is 
the inheritance of the saints. This is what we can look forward to, not because of any good in us, but because of the marvelous work of our beloved, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what he has won for us. This is the inheritance that he has won for us at Calvary. And this is our future. This is our glorious destiny. So now we move into the epilogue. And again, this is really significant. It's the last words of the last of the apostles. It's the last recorded words of Jesus Christ. <laughs> it, it, it really is a very significant section, 16 verses, and they may be divided up into three sections, all of them connected with this promise, behold, I come quickly. So I'm just going to give you the outline in verses six through nine. There's the there's an emphasis in the light of his coming. So again, it, the promises. Uh, let's just maybe emphasize that verse seven. Behold, I come quickly. Okay, the first section is verses six through nine. So in the light of that promise, behold, I come quickly. The emphasis is on keeping his sayings, and so we, 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 in the light of his coming, how should we live? How should we conduct ourselves? He's coming quickly. How, what should we do? Well, we should keep his saying. Secondly, uh, verse 10 through 15, the second promise is verse 12, and behold, I come quickly. Again, he says it again. And the emphasis here is not so much on uh, keeping his sayings, but doing his commandments. We see that quite clearly in verse 14, blessed are they that do his commandments. So in the, again, in the light of his imminent return, how should we live? We keep his sayings, we do his commandments. And then the final one, uh, and so that's 6 through 9, 10 through 15, final section, 16 through 21, the emphasis is on waiting for his coming. And again, the final promise of his coming is verse 20. He that testifieth these things saith, surely I come quickly. And it tells us how we should wait for his coming. What does that look like, uh, waiting for his coming, and he's going to give us a very clear indication of how we should wait for his coming, what we should be uh, involved in while we wait for this promise to be fulfilled. Now, as we dive into this section, and we think of this first section on keeping his sayings, it, it is uh, very significant that the epilogue, as it were, this last section, mirrors the introduction, the first section, which is quite often the case. And so I want to point out three ways the book of Revelation ends just as it had begun. And there's an emphasis on three things in the first chapter and the last chapter that we need to kind of lay hold on. And so the first emphasis that he wants us to get from the first chapter, from the last chapter is this, the certainty of God's word. And so the first thing he says here in verse six, he said unto me, these sayings are faithful and true. These sayings are faithful and true. Now, again, maybe you might want to keep a ribbon or a marker in Revelation chapter one. And again, it's really just the first three verses of Revelation one, but we're just saying it ends as it began. And so we, we've got this idea of the certainty of the word of God, where he says, these things are faithful and true. Let's read Revelation 1, verse 1 and 2. Revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must surely, shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. And I want you to just get that idea. He's bearing record of the word of God, He's bearing testimony to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and all things that he saw. So John is saying, I, I, I'm willing to take the stand, if you like. I'm willing to go in the witness stand and testify of the word of God and of the, the testimony of Jesus Christ that are found in that in this book, which he saw as a wine eyewitness. And so the thought is both beginning and ending is that the word of God is true. It, it's, it's, 
It's it, people are willing to testify in the dock and say, this is a true testimony of God, faithful and true. Now, it's interesting that this phrase, uh, faithful and true in Revelation 22, it's found again, uh, we've seen it in chapter 19 and verse 11, where the Lord Jesus comes out of heaven. It says, I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And so here's this interesting thought. The Lord Jesus, who is the living word, is faithful and true. And now we're having this. The, the scriptures, which is the written word, th these sayings, he says, are also faithful and true. And how could it be anything else? If it's coming from the person who is faithful and true, then the document itself must be faithful and true. And so he begins by emphasizing the absolute reliability of the book, just like the Lord Jesus himself is absolutely trustworthy and faithful uh, and, and true. And so, and by the way, this the word faithful and true, uh, faithful has, has the idea of completely trustworthy. You can absolutely depend on the Lord Jesus and you can depend on the sayings of this book to be true. And then faithful and then true is the idea of genuine. And so we might say this, in the last days, one of the things that will characterize the last days is deception. And it will be very hard to find anything that is trustworthy. But in the midst of the deception of these last days, what he wants us to know is this. First of all, the Lord Jesus, the living word, well, he's trustworthy. You can really trust him. And the sayings of this book are equally trustworthy in a world of deception. What a wonderful thing to have that, that assurance. And then also in the last days, there's a lot of fakes. I heard of a, an assembly recently where... Um, the, somebody in the assembly, uh, they, they had got a call and uh, all the Christians in the assembly had got a call and the person in the assembly uh, apparently had been kidnapped, a sister in the assembly, and was uh, her voice was on the call and she was crying and she was saying, they're going to chop my fingers off unless you pay money. And it was all done by artificial intelligence. The whole thing was a scam. It was a fake. And actually the lady was safe and sound but they'd actually been able to fake her voice because of they picked her voice up on social media and they're able to do that and so the, the thing is today everything seems fake it's hard to find anything that's genuine <laughs> that's the real thing well let me tell you the lord jesus is genuine he's faithful and true and the scriptures are also genuine. There's nothing fake about the word of God. There's a lot of things out there that claim to be the word of God that are pure fakes. Book of Mormon is a fake. Uh, the Quran, the whole thing is a fake. The whole thing is a scam. All of these so-called books are fakes, but this is the real deal. This is the real thing. And so how thankful we are to have the absolute reliability of both the book and the Lord Jesus. And so then, we, we thought about really the uh, the trustworthiness of these sayings. And so he, again, he goes on, he says, these sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which shortly shall be done. And so again, we, we notice um, the phrase holy prophets. And again, we, we, we think of Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So again, uh, there's the idea that this book, um, that it's not just a, the genuine book, but there's a holiness attached to this book. It's from a holy God about a holy Savior, and it was given by holy men who were moved by the Holy Spirit. And we might say this, that the best way for us to be able to understand it is to be able to walk in holiness. That helps us to, uh, to understand the book. D.L. Moody, I like what he said. He said this, sin will keep me from this book, and this book 
will keep me from sin. <laughs> That's a pretty good statement, isn't it? And it is true that uh, if we get involved in sin, it takes away the appetite for the book. If we're in the book, it takes away the appetite for sin. And so, again, holiness is connected. Reliability, holiness connected with, to it. The second thing that we see um, is the the, the promise that uh, it begins and ends with the idea of the close fulfillment of God's word. And so again, we we saw uh, back in, in chapter 1 and verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified by his angel to his servant John, things which must shortly come to pass. And again, as we look at chapter uh, 22, it says again, verse 6, uh, he said to me, these things are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. And so we have this, this thought that this is going to happen. And when it happens, it's going to happen very, very quickly. You can be sure it's going to happen. And when it happens, it will happen quickly. The God who acted through the Old Testament prophets and so controlled them to bring uh, his word to men is the same God who acted again in this dispensation to show future events. And he, th he says these things must indicates the divine program is fixed and certain things which must, you know, when it's a must, it's, there's no, there's no kind of option here. This is, these things must come to pass that there's no failure that's going to be seen in the fulfillment of the prophetic scriptures. And then secondly, they must shortly. Uh, so when the program is begun, it will be swiftly executed. The end time program could begin at any moment. Again, with the promise, behold, I come quickly. It could happen at any moment. The word shortly uh, in, in the Greek language is the same word which we get our English word tachometer from. And the idea is this, that literally it's, it speaks of speedy. Shortly, speedy. When the program begins, it will certainly rev up and be executed speedily. And so again, we see the connection between the beginning and the ending of the book of Revelation, the promise that these things are going to be speedily done. God's word is true. These things are going to happen. When they happen, they're going to happen quickly. And then, of course, it begins and ends with the idea of God is in the business of communicating his word. And so, again, we saw in one, one, one the things that it says he sent and signified by his angel to his servant, John. God is, he wants these things to be known. He wants to communicate truth concerning the end times. And again, in 22 verse 6, again, it says, uh, these are the faithful saints and, are tr and true. The Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show to his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. The idea is this, the Lord does not want us to be in the dark concerning prophecy. He, he's, he wants to communicate it. He's, he's showing us these things. He's revealing these things to us, and he wants us to understand them. And so, again, just how the book begins, how it ends with these truths being stated. Now, notice verse 7, uh, the first of three references to his coming quickly. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And again, it's the Lord Jesus himself speaking here. And he, of course, he's the one who is faithful and true and trustworthy. And so what is he telling us? He's personally interrupting this whole dialogue to say, I am coming quickly. He is coming quickly. There will be no delay. And this is the sixth beatitude of the book. It says, blessed is he that keeps the sayings of the prophecy of this book. So what does it mean to keep? Well, it means to, to both watch over. Remember that, that old hymn, vainly they kept his bed, Jesus my savior. Uh, you know, so the idea is to keep watch. And so those that keep the sayings of this book, they're watching over these things. They're, they're watching for their fulfillment. There's this expect expectancy. It has the idea of holding fast. 
uh, to hold fast to these things. When you keep something, you hold on to it, hold fast. And then the idea of to don't forget, keep it in remembrance. And so the idea is this, somebody who takes the sayings of this book and they, they're watching over them. They're looking expectantly for their fulfillment. They're holding fast to them, to the, to the faith of the overcomer. They're holding fast with confidence, no matter how black the world gets. They're, they're, that promise, they're holding fast to it, and they never forget it. They live in the light of it. In fact, it really refers to one who ally, allows the life to be controlled by the word, or to put it into active sense, lives in the light of the word. The truth of this book, if we really believed it, we really let it impact us, it would it would change our lives forever. And so the blessing comes to those who keep the sayings of this book. And so we've heard about how trustworthy the book is, but now the emphasis is on our fidelity to the book. Are we those that are known for keeping his sayings? Are we the ones that that have that faithfulness to the book? We we believe it. We we live expectantly, uh, looking for these promises. We let it grip our lives and affect our lives. And so that's the the thought that's being conveyed here. Now, you need to notice verse eight. John's response. It says, "And I, John, saw these things and heard them." And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Interesting for John, this is the second time we have witnessed him do this. We believe saw it in chapter 19, um, where verse 10, I fell at his feet. This is the angel again to worship him. And he said to me, see, thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so very interesting that there are three occasions where John falls down. Two of them, he is rebuked for doing it because he falls down at the feet of an angel. But the first time he falls down is in Revelation 1 when he falls down before the glorified Christ. And there is no rebuke given when he falls down before a glorified Christ. And so what we can say is that um, no created being should ever be worshipped. Scripture is absolutely clear on that. In contrast, the Lord Jesus, who clearly cannot be a created being, because we read in Hebrews 1.6, let all the angels of God worship him. Uh, We see throughout scripture that he receives worship from men. And again, it would be utter blasphemy for him to do anything uh, such like this if he was anything less than God. And so again, just another affirmation of the absolute deity of Christ. Another thought that's here, we thought about fidelity to the book, but there's also a fellowship connected with the book as well. Because in response, the angel said, then saith he unto me, verse 9, see thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. And the idea is this, that it's good to know we're not alone. We, we, the worshipers of God, were in this blessed fellowship concerning the book. Uh, The the angels uh, who did not rebel they're considered to be our fellow servants. <laughs> and so they're, they're in this together. So there's this kind of fellowship with them, fellow servants. And then he says, thy brethren, the prophets. Well, again, we, we're, we're in harmony with them. We're, we're in fellowship with them. And what, what is the focus of the book? If you like, there's a fellowship connected with the book. And the focus of the book is this, worship God. <laughs> the, so fidelity to the book, the wonderful fellowship connected with the book and finally the focus of the book is worship god and isn't it wonderful that we're we're all on part of an amazing fellowship that worships god in three persons that that goes on around the world and we're part of this and it's a wonderful thing the very best company those that worship 
God. And so that should be the focus of the book. Again, just a, a reminder, John twice now falling before this angel and worshiping him. And one thing that it, it ought to tell us is this. And we've, we've emphasized this many times in our studies. The best of men are men at best. And men are prone to err. The Lord doesn't, but men do. And even this great apostle, twice he falls down and worships an angel when only God is to be worshipped. And the fact that John does it twice shows that for most of us, if not all of us, it takes a long time to learn some lessons. <laughs> He's already been rebuked in chapter 19. He does it again in chapter 22. And don't we see ourselves in that? Do we get everything the first time we hear it? Or are we sometimes slow learners? We have to, it takes a while for us to learn the lessons that the Lord is trying to teach us. So that's the first section, keeping his sayings. The next section from verse 10 to 15 is doing his commandments. And so we read, it says, and he saith unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. And so he begins by uh, telling us not to seal the things of this book. The time is at hand. And again, what a contrast to the book of Daniel. And I want you just to look there a moment. I just finished reading Daniel in my uh, my own devotions. And, and Daniel 12, verse 4, some of the things that Daniel was shown had to be sealed up. He says, verse 4 of Daniel 12, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So Daniel is told to seal up the book. Here we are, book of Revelation chapter 21, and the command is given, don't seal up these things. These, these are things that we need to, uh, men need to know. And so centuries had rolled away. History had unfolded before the end time prophecies of Daniel could be fulfilled. Son of man had to come and suffer first before he would go to the glory and then reveal this final stage of his ministry. And so we have this idea of now the season is at hand. Now the time is at hand. And so he tells us not to seal these things up. Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And then a very kind of staggering scripture in verse 11. And this is where human responsibility comes in. He, he says, and again, is, it, is this this last chapter, this epilogue, I, I really believe there's some really kind of powerful appeals to men to choose Christ, to, to repent of their sins and believe the gospel in the light of the things we've been studying, the, the things that are coming upon the earth, the, the, the coming of Christ, the, the eternity in the lake of fire or in the new Jerusalem. In the light of these things, there's these kind of urgent appeals to human responsibility. And so he says, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. And, and so what he's saying is that men make choices in life and God will hold them to their decisions. If they choose to be unjust. Now, how can a man become just? Well, the justification is by faith in the finished work of Christ. He that's unjust, in other words, he doesn't respond to the, the gospel call. Then what's he going to be like throughout all eternity? He'll be unjust still. He that is filthy, he refused to come to be cleaned. He, he refused to come and, and have his sins cleansed. You know, come and let's reason together. Though your sins are scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. He refused to come. And so what is he going to be in all eternity? He's going to be filthy still. On the other hand, he that is righteous. How do we get righteous? Righteousness by faith, the one that comes to Christ. What's he going to be like in eternity? He'll be righteous still. He that is holy, how do we become holy? Again, it's through Christ. He makes us saints. He sanctifies us. Let him be holy still. And so the thought is this. If men reject the word, which is true and faithful, then they will forever seal their condition. They will forever be in that condition in which they die in rejecting the word of God. It is the hopelessness of the final state of the wicked, which is here pictured. The states of both the evil and the good are now fixed forever. 
There's no word here about any second chance or any possibility of change. If you're unjust, let him be unjust still. And so it's it's almost like divine permission is being given to withdraw any attempt to change men. They have chosen in life for good or ill by their response to the word of God. And the frightening thing is that Christ accepts the decision. He takes men seriously. And here's the, the amazing thing. The character formed on earth will be taken into eternity, whether for good or ill. Present choices will become permanent in character. And just think about this. So, so the, the unjust throughout all eternity are going to be unjust still. There's going to be no change in their character. The, 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 the filthy, they're going to be filthy still. They're going to carry that throughout all eternity. And so what he's emphasizing is these are, these are eternal significant decisions. What will you do with Jesus Christ? This is eternally significant, and we need to understand that. And so again, the promise, verse 12, and behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. That's why we believe that these last three, behold, I come quickly, is not speaking so much of the second advent to the earth, but of the rapture of the church. Because when Christ comes for his bride, that is when the judgment seat of Christ takes place. That is when rewards are dispensed. And so when he says, behold, I come quickly, he's talking about the rapture, which initiates this program that we're talking about of end time events that's going to come quickly. And so it is the idea of the rapture of the church. And so our rewards are directly connected with that, to give every man according to his works. And again, it's it's not judging our sin, but it's judging our service, a lifetime of service uh, for the individual uh, what will that produce? Is it going to be wood, hay, and stubble? Is it going to be gold, silver, precious stone? And so he says, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. And then he get, again, we have this lovely statement of the Lord Jesus. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And just a simple reminder that everything begins with Christ and everything ends with Christ. He's the beginning and the ending, the commencement and the conclusion. It's all wrapped up in him. He is the first and the last. And then the emphasis of this section, the light of his coming, how should we live? Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city. So here, again, is the seventh and final beatitude of the book of revelation blessed are they that do his commandments now again we get an interesting um textual difference here and so if you look at darby's translation it doesn't say blessed are they that do his commandments it says blessed are they that wash their robes that they might have right to the tree of life the american standard version blessed are they that wash their robes that they may have right to the tree of life so there is a textual difference between the translators uh, that, that use the majority text and those that use the critical text. However, the difference doctrinally is insignificant. And the reason is for this. The reason that anybody does his commandments is because they love him. And the reason they love him is that their robes have been washed so there's really not a doctrinal different difficulty uh, what did the lord say if you love me keep my commandments why do we love him well we love him because he first loved us we love him because of what he did for us on calvary he, he washed us and so and and so obedience to the word is the reality of which washing the robes is a metaphor now, let me just say this on these textual issues. Almost invariably, if I'm faced with a textual difficulty, I, I usually reject the critical text because behind the critical text is higher criticism, which I believe is from the pit of hell. So usually I go with the received text. And so let me just say this. The vast majority of texts 
have do his commandments. Only two have washed his robes, and there the Alexandrian text, which was the hotbed, by the way, of Gnostic heresy. And even if that translation was true, there's still a difficulty, because apparently, maybe Angelo can confirm this afterwards, but the word that usually is used for washed um, in the, the text is speaking of something that has already happened in the past. Whereas here, apparently the word is wash and keep on washing. And so that's a bit of a problem, right? Because uh, we've, uh, we're, we've already been washed in the blood of Christ. And so again, it would lean to the fact that the, the critical text is not correct in this. Those who do his commandments are vitally different to those that disobey him, the unjust and the filthy. And so notice it's not knowing his commandments or even hearing his commandments, but it is doing his commandments. And again, I want you to go back with me to John's gospel, um, chapter 14, just a couple of scriptures in John 14. Uh, we've already mentioned one uh, without directly reading from it, but John 14, verse 15. It says, <clears throat> uh, and if you love me, keep my commandments. And then verse 21 of John 14, we read this. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved to my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. And so it, it's evidence of our love for Christ because of what he's done for us that we do his commandments. And now again, none of us do it perfectly, but the general tenor of our life is to be those that do his commandments, to, to follow the Lord Jesus, to follow his commands. And so as a result of that, it says we may enter in through the gates into the city. And what a wonderful thing it is to be able to do that. And they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city. That's the result of someone who, having come to love the Lord Jesus because of his redeeming work, do his commandments. And again, the contrast is brought before us again, and I think he wants to bring this sharply in focus, the contrast between the fate of those that know the Lord and the fate of, fate of those that have rejected the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so on the one hand, blessed, how incredibly happy, of those that do his commandments, this is what they have right to, the tree of life, they enter in through the gates of the city. And then he says, verse 15, for without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whoever loveth and maketh a lie. And so once again, the bliss of the redeemed is set before us in the contrast with the plight of the unsaved. The unsaved are abandoned and outside, beyond the pale of God's love, kindness, and blessing. Oh, the tragedy of being outside of Christ. In eastern lands, dogs would never be permitted to cross the threshold of a home. By their very nature, they belonged without, and this is where they had to stay. Dogs in the oriental cities are scavengers, and excite unspeakable contempt. That's why the Gentiles were called dogs. It wasn't complimentary. Uh, 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 even the dogs get the crumbs that come from the master's table, and it was they get leftovers. And so they're always viewed in a very negative light. And beware of dogs, Paul uh, says in Philippians 3, verse 2. So again, it's not implying that here's this beautiful heavenly city, and then lying just outside the gates are all these people that uh, are um, unholy. We've already learned where they will be. They're not going to be in the city. Their eternal destiny is given to us in chapter 21, verse 8, which is in the lake of fire. It says, <clears throat> The fearful, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. 
So they're they're outside of this place of bliss. And again, what is he saying? Consequence of choice. Your character will be unchanged and your destiny will be outside of this heavenly city. And actually in this place called the lake of fire, on the other hand, those that have come to Christ, that have heard his words, that take them seriously, that believe them, that do his commandments, what's their future look like? Well, they're going to be in this place of bliss, having access to the tree of life, being able to go through the gates of that city. And so what a, what a contrast now, uh, Verses 16 through 21, our final section, again, waiting for his coming. And the Lord Jesus speaks of himself in three beautiful ways in verse 16. He says, first of all, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. And then he says, I am the root and offspring of David. And then thirdly, the bright and morning star. So he he dresses himself in three different ways in relation to the world, these I, Jesus, In relation to Israel, the root and offspring of David, in relation to the church, the bright and morning star. Now, why do we say those things? Well, the word Jesus, uh, we know, means Savior. Jehovah saves. They will call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And, of course, there's no other name given among men whereby we might be saved. It's the name of Jesus. He's the only Savior. And so, uh, again, very personal. He says, I, Jesus. And so he's very personal words of the Lord Jesus here. Uh, and he, he's speaking and he's informing us that, that behind this book is him. I sent my angel, he says, to testify to you of these things in the churches. And again, what do we learn? The Lord does not want us to be ignorant of Bible prophecy. I, Jesus, sent my angel to testify of these things in the churches. By the way, we haven't heard the word church or churches mentioned since chapter 3. Now it's mentioned again. (laughs) Is that significant? Oh, yes, it's very significant. Yeah, we saw the bride, but only in heaven. But on earth, we never saw the church mentioned. We see it now. I testify these things to the churches. This is, and so the idea is this, a church that fails to teach private pro, uh, Bible prophecy is, in, is, is really not listening to the head of the church who wants these things to be testified in the churches. And people say, oh, we don't teach prophecy, too complicated, it's too divisive, what, whatever you do, don't teach on prophecy. Well, that's disobedience to the Lord. He said, I want these things taught. I want them testified in the churches. He wants them to know these things. And then to Israel, I am the root and the offspring of David. So the idea of I am the root is that he was before David. Speaking of his deity, David came into existence because of the Lord Jesus. He's the creator. He's he's the root of David. And then he's the offspring of David. He came into this world in his humanity through the lineage of David. So he he was before David. He's the root of David. His deity is emphasized. He's the offspring of David. He came through the lineage of David. And, And of course, this is what confounded the Pharisees when the Lord Jesus quoted Psalm 110 and said, uh, he's, he's David's Lord. And yet he's also David's son. And they just couldn't get that wrap their minds around that. And it absolutely confounded them. But the point is simply this, that to the nation of Israel, he will secure what's called in Scripture the sure mercies of David. A promise to David that somebody, one of his descendants, would always sit on the throne is going to be filled, fulfilled through the Lord Jesus. The descendant of David, who also is the Lord of David, is the one who's going to fulfill these things. So what a word for Israel. The promises will be fulfilled because he's the root and offspring of David. And then the final one, again, goes back to the church. He's the bright and morning star. The truth of the rapture brings us cheer and encouragement as the shadows of moral and spiritual apostasy deepen around us. It's interesting, the Old Testament closes with a beautiful picture of the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness appearing with healing in his wings. Like the rays going out from the sun, 
they're called wings, right? So um, the, the idea of healing in his wings, it's talking of these rays of the sun. They're, they're, called, they're called wings. And the, so just as, as the dark earth comes to light when the sun comes up, and these rays of light, as it were, bring light to the darkness. This is a picture of Christ's second advent to the earth. When he comes, the son of righteousness, what's going to happen is this world, which will be very dark at his second advent to the earth, won't it? We've looked at the book of Revelation. We've seen how dark it is. And what's going to dispel the darkness? The coming of Christ with healing in his wings. It's going to bring light to the world. It's going to transform it. But before the sun comes up, there's always the bright and morning star. Just before, at the darkest point, in a sense, and before the dawn, there's the morning star before the sun of righteousness. And so the idea is this, that the, the harbinger of the dawn of a new day is the coming of Christ to snatch away his bride. That's the harbinger of a new day. And then this, these prophetic events will come into, uh, into action. They'll happen quickly. Uh, they'll be swift. And the Lord will indeed shed his glorious light over the whole dark planet. And what a day that will be. And so then we see verse 17. The spirit and the bride say, come and let him that heareth say, come and let him that is a thirst come and whoever will let him take the water of life freely. Now, of course, we've we've tended to look at these verses and think in terms of, well, this is the response. You know, the, the Holy Spirit and the bride say, Come, come, Lord Jesus. You promised to be the morning star. You promised you're coming. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. We want that. And of course, we don't want to take away from that. We want that. But I want to suggest to you that this is actually more of a gospel appeal. Because who is he talking to here? He's talking to the one who is thirsty. Whoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. So in the light of the promise of the imminent return of Christ, what would the Holy Spirit be doing and what would the bride be doing? Well, what they would be doing is this. They would be appealing to the world. If you're thirsty, come. Whatever you do, come. Come to him. Come and drink. Uh, in other words, it, 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 it's, it's in a sense the last gospel appeal in the book of Revelation. It's interesting that he, he mentions in this gospel appeal the word whoever will let him take the water of life freely we said uh, and i've said this often but if you read peter's sermon in acts chapter 2 it's the first sermon of the church age and it begins with this uh, this whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved it's a whosoever message and here we have the final gospel appeal of the new testament age and what is it whosoever will let him take of the water of life freely and if the first and the last are whosoever messages what do you think the in-between ones ought to be appeals to the whosoever let him come and so again in the light of the many scriptures that we could pull in to say this is a great gospel appeal isaiah 55 verse 1 uh, again and perhaps this is even in the minds of uh, the uh, the Lord here, as he as we read these words, it says, "Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price." And again, it's interesting that this very passage talks about the sure mercies of David. In verse 3, incline your ear, come unto me, hear, your soul shall live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. And so, again, what an, an appeal. And, and so every re believer who, has, who really has got an understanding of the book of Revelation, what it should do is cause us to join with the Holy Spirit in appealing men to come to Christ. <laughs> That's what it ought to do, right? In, 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 we think of what we've been studying. Uh, are we doing that? Now, we, I was hoping we were going to finish. <laughs> we've got a minute left. But um, 
there's a there's a there's a final kind of admonition here too. He says, "For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add to these things, God shall add to him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in the book." So taking away or adding to the book. First of all, the idea of adding to the book. And again, I I really believe that in the mind of the Lord here is the cultists who say, well, the Bible's okay as far as it goes. But we need a second testament of Jesus Christ, i.e. the Book of Mormon. Or we need to take away from the book again the cultists could be in view here the jehovah's false witnesses how through their tampering with the word of god they take away the essential message but also further than that you have the higher critics men who through their arrogance and pride have sat in judgment on the word of god and they have tried to eliminate any thought of prophetic truth they don't they don't like that idea of of prophetic truth and so so the book of daniel well there's two daniels you see because because how could daniel possibly at the time of babylon and nebuchadnezzar know the history of alexander the great and his four soldiers and all the the things in in chapter 11 how could he possibly how could he know about the roman empire we we they're the modern day sadducees and so what they do is they they actually take away from the word of god from its inspiration from its uh, sufficiency from its authority and they say actually there was two daniels there was there was the one daniel who was taken into captivity and then there's this other guy who wrote at the time of the end of the babylonian captivity uh, at the time of the restoration and all this kind of nonsense and so the warning is this whatever you do do not tamper with this book this is the word of god It's a very serious thing. And for the person that does, well, what is the, what will become of that person? Their infidelity, the cultist, the higher critic, these kind of people that that simply do not believe God. Well, he says he's going to add to them the plagues that are written in this book. This is going to be there. This is what they're going to experience. By the way, it's not just here, but back in Deuteronomy, we have a similar warning. And I think it's the idea. It's not just the book of Revelation that's in view here, but the whole of the word of God. Deuteronomy 4 verse 2, you shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I commanded you. Deuteronomy 12 and verse 32 Again, we we read this. He says, whatsoever things I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereunto, nor diminish from it. And so, again, a solemn warning. This is to critics who have tampered with this book and other portions of Scripture in arrogant self-confidence that they're equipped intellectually and spiritually to determine what is true and what is not true in the Word of God. Do you remember King Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim who cut up the word of God with a penknife? <laughs> it didn't work out very well for King Jehoiakim. And what the warning at the end of this book is, a warning to us, to anybody that would tamper with the word of God. And it says, God shall take away his part of the book of life and out of the holy city from the things which are written in the book. There's a serious exhortation, diminish not a word. And then the final call, he that testify these things saith, surely I come quickly. Now the bride responds. This is no longer the gospel appeal. This is the response of the bride. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And then the final words, which is interesting. Final words of the New Testament, it ends with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be with you all. Amen. What a contrast to the end of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. And how does that end? 
Well, Malachi chapter 4, verse 6, he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. What a difference to end with grace rather than with a curse. And oh, how thankful we are for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we would say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen.